In this lesson, we'll take a look at how to set up and configure PowerShell remoting so we can manage our servers from anywhere. We'll also look at the Kerberos second hop problem and how we can work around this issue. PowerShell remoting connects an administrator's local PowerShell session with a remote system's PowerShell session. PowerShell remoting uses the Windows Remote Management Service, which is built on the web services for management protocol. When the administrator runs a command in their local session, the command is sent to the remote computer and executed there. The remote system then sends the results back to the administrator system. PowerShell remoting actually needs to be set up on the remote computers, not the administrator's machine. Servers running Windows Server 2012 and later versions will automatically be configured for PowerShell remoting. Other clients can run the built-in commandlet seen here to enable and automatically configure this feature. When enabling PowerShell remoting, there are a few things that happen. First, of course, is the ability of the remote machine to receive PowerShell commands. The Windows Remote Management Service is enabled and set to auto start. An HTTP listener is defined on the remote machine, along with a Windows Defender firewall exception for the WS MAN protocol. One thing to point out here is that the listener uses the HTTP protocol. What this means is that the commands being sent aren't encrypted using TLS, but PowerShell remoting is encrypted by default using other means. PowerShell remoting can also be configured to use HTTPS or SSH for encryption. The final task of the commandlet is to define the PowerShell session endpoints and enable session configurations. Session configurations are the settings on the computer that define the environment for PowerShell sessions. These configurations are used by the administrator to protect the computer and prevent unauthorized access. The administrator can define custom environments and permissions for any remote user. Some examples of session configurations include specifying the commandlets that can be used, limiting the size of objects the computer receives, and more. Session configurations are stored in special text files called session configuration files. Once PowerShell remoting is set up and configured, you can start a session by typing enter ps session computer name followed by the name of the computer. We can even create a session with a virtual machine from the host machine by using the enter ps session vm name followed by the name of the virtual machine. Once the session has been created, all commands typed will be sent to the remote machine. Now, if we just want to send one or two commands and don't need to start a new session, we can also use the invoke command commandlet in PowerShell to send a quick script to the remote machine. Also, if we want to create a persistent session, we'll use the new PS session commandlet and store it in a variable. We can even reference this persistent session variable in other scripts if we need to. One cool feature of PowerShell remoting is that not only can we create a one-to-one -one session, but we can also create one-to-many remote sessions. One-to-many remote sessions are incredibly useful when we want to send PowerShell commands to multiple computers all at once. When creating a session, we have to make sure that we're using an administrator account. Because Windows Server uses Kerberos for authentication, one common issue you'll run into is the Kerberos second hop problem. Let's look at what that is and how we can work around it. For example, we open a remote PowerShell session with our remote server here and execute a script, but that script needs to pull a resource from this second server over here. By design, Kerberos will not implicitly pass our administrative privileges over that second hop, which means we can't access or pull the resources from the second server. This issue is the Kerberos second hop problem. Thankfully, Microsoft has given us a few ways to work around the problem. The first method is to enable Credential Security Support Provider, or CRED SSP, for authentication. CRED SSP works by caching the authentication credentials on the remote server and then passing them to the second server. One of the main benefits of using CRED SSP is that it'll work with almost any system from Windows Server 2008 and later. The problem with CRED SSP is that if the remote server is compromised, your administrator credentials can be easily stolen. CRED SSP is disabled by default and must be enabled on both the client and server computers. The other issue with CRED SSP is that it's unconstrained, which means the credential passing will work with any service, not just PowerShell remoting. Now, if we're running on a Windows Active Directory network and using Kerberos, we do have some options to configure Kerberos constrained delegation to pass the credentials to the second hop. Enabling Kerberos delegation does provide more security than CRED SSP, 
but can be more complicated to set up. Another option is to configure just enough administration in PowerShell. Essentially, this option allows the administrator to specify exactly what commandlets and functions a user can run. We can also limit the number of administrators on the machines and get transcripts and logs of what commands are executed during a session. This option does require configuration on each server, however, so it can be complicated to set up. Another solution is to use the run as credential parameter from the remote server and provide our credentials. This essentially refreshes the authentication and ignores the second hop problem. The problem with this solution is that you do have to edit the PowerShell session configuration to allow the run as credential. This can be a hassle if you're dealing with multiple servers. One final option is to simply pass our credentials inside an invoke command script block. This option doesn't require any additional configuration and works great if we only need to perform this once or twice. The syntax for this command can get awkward, so if we need to execute multiple commands, this probably wouldn't be the best option. That'll wrap up this lesson on PowerShell remoting. In this lesson, we first went over what PowerShell remoting is and how to set up and configure this feature. Remember that PowerShell remoting has to be set up on the remote machine, not the administrator's computer. We then looked at the Kerberos second hop problem and some methods of getting around this, including using cred SSP, Kerberos delegation, just enough administration, using the run as credential parameter, or passing our credentials inside an invoke command script block.